Okay, so I'm delighted that we're going to welcome Mark Spencer again for uh, okay, starting your screen sharing. That's great. Mark is the LNH, LNHS clerk recorder. He's a very active member of the Botany Committee and he's also the BSBI recorder for Middlesex and he's a very renowned botanist. He's worked as a consultant. He spent many years at the Natural History Museum. He's a very well-respected speaker and he now also works as a forensic botanist. And you might be interested in his book, A Little Pug, Murder Most Florid, which is a first person account of this career. We're certainly very lucky to have him in the LNHS and delighted that he's offered to present this Habitat series, which is proving particularly popular. So I'm going to hand you over to now to Mark for another great talk in our series. Over to you. Thank you very much, Mary, and good evening to everybody, both within the London area and internationally. Um, this evening's talk, I, I'm going to forewarn you, may come with some ranting because it is fair to say that our, our grasslands in the London area, both neutral and calcareous, are some of our most vulnerable and endangered habitats. And it's true not just only of the London area, but much of um, Great Britain and Ireland as a whole as well. Um, these are habitats that were once widespread throughout our landscapes, and they have suffered catastrophic declines over the last hundred years or so. And for those of you who may be familiar with um, British and English natural history, you will have sometimes heard the figure of 97% loss of our lowland species rich grasslands, which is an absolutely dreadful figure. Many of our grassland types are now some of the rarest habitats surviving in our country. And the same is also true of the London area. I'm going to be primarily focusing on relatively species rich and relatively diverse grasslands of the neutral soils, which are usually made up of sandy loam slimes with some influence of calcareous influence in the London area, primarily from the chalk rocks that are just to the north of London in the form of the Chiltern Hills and just to the south of much of Greater London, which is the North Downs of Kent and Surrey. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to talk in a later talk about some of the more urbanized grasslands, the amenity grasslands of our roadsides, football pitches, and those mown pieces of grassland that we find in our very most urban spaces, because these are also overlooked and often quite species rich habitats. But I'm going to be largely concentrating on remnant pieces of grassland which reflect a deeper landscape history in the London area. And they broadly fall into two main types. Um, neutral grasslands that were cut seasonally for hay, um, and these were often associated with production of meat or milk and around the London area for supplying the growing London over the last few hundred years, and calcareous grasslands of our chalk soils, which were usually grazed seasonally by um, sheep, and various forms of management were in place as well for this. I'm not going to go into details about the grassland management history because it is diverse and complicated, um, but there are many good books on the history and management of grasslands in, in the United Kingdom, um, particularly within the New Naturalist series, which some of you may have heard of. So without further ado, I'm going to move on and remind you that this talk is really being brought together through the collaborative efforts, knowledge and skills, not only of the community within the Natural, London Natural History Society, a community of volunteers and amateurs, but it is also dependent upon the knowledge and skills and logistical support in many respects of the Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland and Green Space Information for Greater London. So the data that the London Natural History Society's membership collects from the botany section goes to Giggle, which is London's Biological Records Centre, and also into the national database, the BSBI. And these databases are important on a national basis for understanding shifts in plant biodiversity, conservation, et cetera, et cetera. And also to just remind you once more in the form of this map about where London sits in this kind of in this in this mapping area and regimes. The red outline is the current boundaries of Greater London as we now know it. The original city of London nestling somewhere in the middle just here, 
with the Isle of Dogs there. My BSBI county of Middlesex is this bit up here, which is, takes up a pretty large chunk of the modern city, um, city of Greater London, with little snippets just here on the outs. To the south, we have Surrey, and to the southeast, we have Kent. To the northeast, we have Essex, and then we have uh, Bedfordshire, and over here, sorry, we're at Hertfordshire, apologies. <laughs> getting my geography and a little snippet of Buckinghamshire over here and this circle around here reflects what we call the LNHS polygon which is the overall area of interest that the London Natural History Society records and studies in and Bookham is somewhere down here I can never quite remember exactly where and also to let you know as well as Bookham we have another continuous surveying program which has been running for many decades as well up in Hampstead Heath in North London. Um, and I suspect by now, if you've been following my series, I've shown you many of these maps based upon the data that's in the BSBI. Remember, this is data that's not collected just by the BSBI, but by the London Natural History Study and many other organisations as well. So it is truly a collaborative exercise. And what I've done here is to choose a plant which is pretty widespread and is found in essentially both neutral and calcareous grasslands in this country and you'll notice straight away that these grassland types are quite widely distributed across the London area. This you may recall is in sharp contrast to some of the acidic grasslands that I was talking about last time which were quite limited in extent by, by comparison. So this is a sort of reasonably good indication of where these grassland types can or have been found in the past, because this is all data. This is a total data set for this one plant species in this area. And there are 6,803 observations or records being made over the last two or 300 years or so. So it's quite a large data set for just one species. The paler blobs, just to remind you, indicate uh, almost certainly losses or maybe not being recorded. Um, you'll notice in this band up in Hertfordshire, there are relatively few recent records for this species compared down to in the south for Surrey. Now, this may actually reflect some recorder biases and also, frankly, getting data into the database system because each vice county, as they're called, these geographic areas, runs independently in many respects from each other. We all have our own schedules and our own lives and data sort of gets added and updated with a bit of an ebb of flow of our own personal existences. So you have to take into account that there may be some sort of biases in the data because of people's lives. So this is a widespread species. For those of you who are not familiar with it, it is one of our more attractive wild flowers, a member of the pea family, a delightful little legume, um, and member of quite a large genus, the genus Lotus, which is primarily distributed around the Mediterranean basin. This is center of diversity for the genus. And we have uh, five species that have, uh, grow wild in, in Britain. Now, just to sort of dwell a little bit more in detail on the mapping of this particular species, what I've done with this data is look at it in a slightly different way. I've cut out all of the old records, by which I mean pre-2000, um, and you'll see that actually recording efforts have actually really massively increased over the last few years within the amateur natural community. That's not because we've failed in the past to go out and observe. It's just that our behavior traits for how we manage information and collate it have changed over the last few decades. And many of the earlier records are in rather harder to reach forms of publication and manuscript, et cetera, et cetera, or people's notebooks. So we have now an increasingly sophisticated system for compiling data from members of the society and other organizations and flowing it in to the national database system. So here we have the post 2000 records for this widespread and common plant. And you'll see that the darker green dots are scattered in various places like 
South London, um, the borders there with Surrey, and few areas in the western, in sort of western central Middlesex, my county, and some little ones. This density is actually probably reflecting recorder bias. There are more active people recording in this area. So to actually explore this a little bit further, I stepped outside of the kind of the, um, the grassland idea to compare a couple of other really, really widespread um, plants that are found in southern and eastern England, oh, excuse me, um, to see how this sort of bias potential or potential bias in recording looks. So here we have two species that are incredibly widespread. Poa annua, annual meadow grass, is one of the most successful wild of successful wild plants of these islands and is globally one of the most successful plant species in temperate regions with a massive range now due to human activity. And you can see that since 2000, us botanists have made a mere near, nearly 16,000 records of this plant species in the London area of the LNHS polygon. But there's a very, very strong bias to central London. And this is probably in part to do with the fact that this is a species which is very easily observable as a street weed. You can see it in streets, et cetera, et cetera, very easily. So that probably accounts for some bias recording. But you will notice, for example, just here, this little dot is reflected by the mapping over here, of exactly the same area. So you're getting some strong biases with individuals and I know who this person is up here. They've done some absolute stalwart recording effort of plants in their area to actually give these strange gods. So if you move across to Urtica dioica, our common stinging nettle, a very important widespread plant of nutrient rich habitats, ditches, woodland margins, hedgerows, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you'll see again, a rather strange, bumpy, characteristic in its distribution. Again, I suspect this is to a certain degree, this is recorded bias. And once more, with both of these species, we can see relatively few records in the main national databases yet up in the north, probably because of the cycle of recording and managing information, as I said earlier. So looking at these pieces of data are quite helpful in giving us an understanding of the mapping that we see across the board for the London area. Now, I'm going to come to um, a plant which is undoubtedly associated, certainly in this country, with, um, with our grasslands, with our meadows, as they're often referred to, hay meadows. And this is geranium pretensi. I'll show you the photograph this in a moment. Now, geranium pretensi is, I'm sorry, I'm going to rewind on this. One thing I wanted to say about this plant is you have to be careful about making assumptions about where a plant grows in your region has the same habitat preferences in other parts of the world. Sometimes for all sorts of reasons that we don't fully understand with certain plants, they can actually shift their ecosystem preferences depending on where they are. But in this country, geranium pretensi is almost entirely a plant of grasslands. It is a plant that prefers somewhat calcareous, slightly limey soil. Um, and that is not a common soil type certainly in Greater London itself. Uh, and actually most of the sort of calcareous, the chalk soils that we have in the LNHS area are in this large band to the north, running through much of modern day Hertfordshire and to the south in Surrey through the, the South Downs of Kent and parts of Buckinghamshire up here. So how come does this plant have this rather random and patchy distribution. These are post 2000 records, 432 of them. And the reason for that is because this plant is frankly jolly attractive. It's a very handsome and beautiful thing as you'll see in a moment. And therefore it is quite often planted in the environment by those of us who are rather enthused by the idea of habitat creation. Unfortunately, in many cases, those people don't record their activities. So some of these dots are actually quite hard sometimes to make decisions as to whether it is a native natural colony of a plant that's been there for hundreds or thousands of years, or whether it has been recently introduced through the activities of humanity. Now, you get that ambiguity in the London area, but we do know this occurs 
as a natural wild plant in the region, but it primarily occurs on the river corridors coming off the limestone or off the chalky soils. So you'll notice down here to the south and the west is running along, for those of you who don't know this, this is actually the line of the River Thames. And the River Thames has over the last few thousand years, partly because of the activities of humanity, it has been inundated and deluged rather with quantities of chalky soil, particularly from the Chilterns, but from other um, hill systems around its area. And this chalky calcareous soil has been deposited in patches or lenses in various parts of the river valley. This has made locally the conditions for this particular plant species suitable in areas where, broadly speaking, it's not quite um, as it would be normally. So some of these, particularly around the river, um, River Thames here are natural occurrences. This too here is a river system. This is the River Crane. And there are one or two other patches where these are probably remnant populations of former much, much larger landscape. Because these lowland hay meadows, as I said, are much, much reduced in area now. This is a plant which you look at the botany records in the 18th and 19th century, and it's described as common, widespread, very, very frequent in many of the counties surrounding London today. That is not the case now. It is often highly localised and often very uncommon with only a few individuals surviving. So many of these other dots in central London are almost certainly recent horticultural introductions. What does it look like? This. This is one of it. It's an absolutely glorious plant, a wonderful and beautiful thing. One of our most outstanding wild plants. And next to it, I've got another fascinating plant of um, uh, London area. And this is the one with the rather fabulous name of corky fruited water dropwort. Onanthi pimpanelloides. Um, now, corky fruity water dropwort is in a British context rather unusual because other members of the genus Onanthi that grow in this country tend to like marshy, wet habitats, not pimpanelloides. It is a plant of primarily dry or seasonally damp grassland it is not a bog lover it does not like having its feet wet particularly when it's growing in the summer so it's a rather unusual member of the genus as i suspect many of you can tell this is a member of the, the carrot family the umbelliferae now corky fruity water dropwort is a very very interesting plant in britain all of the oenanthes have very curious distributions are very specific and in Britain, this is largely restricted as a wild plant to places such as Sussex, Hampshire, Dorset, parts of Surrey. It's southern central England, and it can actually be very, very common in parts of those areas. For example, it is locally abundant on the Isle of Wight, where I have a home. Historically, this plant has always been very, very rare in the Greater London area with two or three known sites. So when I first started botanizing in London nearly 30 years ago, this was restricted to about three sites in the London area. Bit by bit, we have found it in more locations. It is still decidedly uncommon and is restricted to these lowland meadows, but we're not entirely sure why it is, appears to be getting more abundant. It may be that we're noticing it a little bit more. Sometimes members of the carrot family are overlooked. But a key hypothesis about how this may be becoming more common, possibly climate change, is a southern plant, it likes it warm, but it may also be that this is a plant that is being inadvertently assisted by local authorities when they come to mow these meadows because these meadows are not are no longer grazed or extremely rarely grazed by animals. They're not used for making hay. The grass is usually cut and then taken away. And it's quite probable, and one or two other species we've seen this within grasslands in London area, that the rather robust fruits and the stems they're on get caught up in the mowing gear of the vehicles and get moved from site to site. Um, this, this particular one was photographed in the wonderful grasslands, along with this geranium, just in front of Ham House, just on the edge of the River Thames in southwest London, a really wonderful location to visit. 
with some really fine and diverse grassland and wet woodland habitats. So I'm going to move south, broadly speaking, and really start focusing on sort of chalky calcareous soils, um, but also then tell you about how actually this, this reflects some significant shifts in the distribution of some plants. So here we have a rather delightful little thing called an eyebright. I've not noticed, I've just noticed it's rather poor photograph. I do apologize. Now, eyebrights are hemiparasites. They're related to orobankies, which are hollow parasites, which means they have no chlorophyll and they're entirely dependent on stealing food from other plants by sticking their root systems, their specialized structures into the roots of other plants. Eyebrights are semi-cheats in that they actually utilize some food from the plants around them, but they can also photosynthesize. You can see this has got green leaves that produce their own energy as well. So eyebrights are semi-parasites. They are strongly associated with species-rich grassland, both neutral, acid and calcareous, and different types of eyebright species tend to prefer different types of soil type or slightly different ecosystems. They are tricky plants to identify. Um, and in the London air, we've got about three or four species, most of which are now increasingly rare. So you'll notice here, this is the all records. So this is going back 400 years or so of recording in the London area. We've got only about a thousand records for this species over these last few hundred years. You can see these large squares, which basically reflect some sort of rather generalized recording. It used to be the standard practice, say, 40, 50 years ago, that with mapping, we would map to a 10 kilometer res um, resolution. We now try and do one kilometer or even finer in some circumstances. So these big dots are generally older records, and these smaller and darker dots are much, much more recent. What I've done here with this map is actually, I've actually stacked the data so you can see the abundance of records in these areas. And you can see this species is today almost entirely restricted to the chalk to the south of London, sometimes into the borough of Croydon, for example. And one, one tiny, tiny area in the northwest, because there's one small area in the northwest of London where the chalk is more or less at the surface and the soil is quite strongly calcareous. It's a little area called Harefield. In fact, it's the officially the only chalk downland in my county of Middlesex, Middlesex occurs up here. Um, tragically, it is now in a lamentable state and really does not deserve the name downland because it has been virtually stripped of all its species diversity through absolutely dreadful landscape management. So this is a Euphrasia. These are always good plants to find, if and if you can't quite identify them, because they tell you this is old landscape because Euphrasias don't move around very much. They're pretty intolerant of being shifted around. So if you find Euphrasias, you're often going to find many other interesting species. Oh, I forgot I put this on. Oh, yes. So that was the total records and that was the post records. You can see there's been a bit of a retrenchment into the south and the northwest. I'm going to move past that because I forgot I put that slide in. I was very naughty. I didn't have time to do this talk until a little bit earlier today, so I've not had a chance to go through it all. Now, some of you may remember this image. I wanted to put this image in because this I talked about in my acid grasslands talk. Um, a few weeks ago, but I've put this back in again because Dyer's greenweed is a species which straddles the kind of spectrum of being weakly acidic soils into neutral, into moderately calcareous. So it's a little bit of a cheat putting it back in, but again, this is a species which is strongly indicative of old landscape and large environment. And if you find Dyer's greenweed, which itself is actually potentially at risk of extinction in England, you are very, very likely to find other plant species of significance. And this was actually photographed in one of the best remaining sites for it in the London area, which is Horsenden Hill, which I will be talking about a little bit later on today. <laughs> 
Another species which I mentioned last time was Thymus polytrichus, wild thyme. Now this species is primarily associated in England with acidic soils, coastal sea cliffs, nutrient poor, dry, short grassland because it's a small plant and it cannot tolerate tall swords and other types of tall vigorous plant. But it does occur on occasion in calcareous soils on chalk. And the reason for that is if you've got a, a nice piece of chalk downland, very species rich with lots of fantastic plants in it, the top bits often the soil leaches out nutrients and actually the, the pH drops. So you will often find in certain parts of chalk downlands little patches more neutral to slightly acidic soil which also can accumulate humus, which makes it more acidic. So this is a plant which is occasionally found in chalk grasslands, but the really common species that you'll find in the London area, particularly to the south, where we've still got some quite good pieces of chalk grassland, is its relative um, polytrime, thymus pulegioides, large thyme. They're a little bit tricky to tell apart until you've got practice, but large thyme has got a really beautiful, distinctive lemony scent. And with a little practice, you can smell large thyme from a very long way away, and you'll know you've got that and not polytrichus. So these are two plants which are kind of straddling ecosystems and habitat preferences in many ways. But I'm now going to come momentarily onto one of our most much maligned but fabulous groups of plants strongly associated with open grassland habitats of all forms across the country and in many other parts of the world. These are fabulous dandelions. Um, dandelions are some of the least well appreciated by non-natural historians in this country. They're fantastically important for biodiversity and we should cherish them and look at how wonderful and glorious this plant is. They're also biologically fascinating because many species of dandelion are apomyctes, which means they reproduce asexually. So despite having a flower and producing seed, it's all done through asexual processes. There's none of that, that naughty stuff going on. So apomyctes are really rather extraordinary and unusual plants. Quite a few lineages of plants do it. Dandelions are some of the well known. As a consequence of apomixis, dandelions and other apomix, for various reasons, become very narrow, small, genetically narrow lineages of plants. Some of them are extremely rare. We have about 230 species of dandelion in Britain and Ireland. Some of them are widespread and weedy. Others, as I say, are very rare and restricted to particular types of ancient landscape. This particular image around the corner from my mother's house in Northamptonshire. Now we're going to dive into the area of ranting. I do apologise, folks. But first of all, I'm going to talk to you about um, one of London's sort of Cinderella landscapes and habitats, because many people have never heard of the glories of Crayford Marsh. It is historically a fascinating place with the history going back to the Norman conquest. This here in front of you is the remnants of a Norman keep that was built by Bishop Odo, who was William the Conqueror's cousin or brother, I always forget which. In behind it, there's a medieval tithe barn and the moat now serves as a rather glorious duck pond and is actually full of all sorts of interesting plant species. And this surrounding area consists of grazing marsh, a particular type of grazed grassland, which is associated with the River Thames. I'm not going to talk in detail about grazing marsh now because I'm going to come back to it later in part. But this is an absolutely wonderful grassland habitat that is fantastic and well worth a visit. Access is not easy. You have to look at it from paths because if you actually walk onto the, the land, you are frankly risking your well-being. Do not do it but it is well worth a visit. Some absolutely stunning views of the River Thames. There's some very good footpaths and the Thames path running nearby it as well. Now, I started the talk by talking about how many of our grassland habitats are incredibly vulnerable 
um, and have suffered hugely over the last 100 years or so. And as I say, this figure of 97% loss has been bandied about rather a lot. In fact, it's probably relatively conservative. In some areas, it's probably 98, 99 or 100% loss of these habitats. Now, this particular image you can see, it was, it was a photograph I took oh, 15 years or so ago, maybe longer, of a place that is um, quite dear in my heart, but has a notorious history in the conservation of sector in London area. This is known as Harmony Wood and Meadows. In the background is Harmony Wood. And you'll notice I've put it in quotation marks. The grassland in front of you, which is next to a major A row just to the right, um, is a piece of very species rich grassland, has, for example, the new corky fruited water dropwort, orchid species, and other notable grassland plants for the London area. Now, unfortunately, sometime I believe in the 1990s, about a third of this site was planted with saplings and therefore destroyed the remnant of this grassland. That is the bit that is referred to as harmony wood. Now, I surveyed this habitat for the GLA habitat, this area for the GLA habitat survey back in 2004 and noted that it was very good quality. And I informed both the GLA and also London Borough of Greenwich that this was a very, very important habitat that needed to be retained and should never have any more trees planted on the remaining piece of grassland. I was promptly ignored by Greenwich Council, and I have that information in writing so I can say it in public, and trees were planted all over this site. Um, several thousand trees were planted over it. And the belief, this widespread belief, that if we need to do things that are good for nature, we must plant trees. Planting trees is a useful thing to do, but not on species-rich grassland. So for those of you who are increasingly concerned about the pressures of climate change and about the need to sequester carbon, if you see a piece of landscape that you think needs to be planted with trees, consider several things. Are there other trees nearby that could naturally regenerate into that landscape? Is this piece of grassland species rich or important or worthy of restoration? If the answer to either of these is yes, then you probably should not be planting trees on this site. Um, as several people who are listening to this talk will know, this particular site then resulted in a very, very notorious series of events because a local activist conservation guy um, and a friend uh, came onto the site and pulled out several trees in the middle of the night over a period of two or three nights and a very nasty court case occurred afterwards. But that action saved this grassland from destruction. This is Harmony Wood inside. I took this photograph, I think maybe on a slightly different visit. You can see inside it has all the typical characteristics of a badly thought through and poorly planted, overly densely planted woodland. This does not have the characteristics of a species rich habitat, which is going to be useful for biodiversity. Oops little bit more ranting in this area and this is actually another site which is close to my heart this is Horsenden Hill in northwest London in the London Borough of Ealing so if we've got any London Borough of Ealing councillors listening pay heed please because this site was heavily damaged by the planting of trees across its area given the rather delightful name of Whitler's Wood this particular piece of grassland and the grassland next to it, which was also planted with thousands of sapling trees at ridiculously high density, had several species in it, including knapweed, Lathyrus pretensis, and various other species which are strongly indicative of species-rich, important grassland. As a consequence, this should never, ever have been planted over. This site, this was taken out two years ago, is now further degraded and within a few years it will be lost forever. What was particularly bizarre about this site was actually this is actually not 
ancient in the sense of being hundreds of years old, this grass, and it's about 150 years old. It was created from a block of woodland, a piece of ancient hornbeam and oak woodland that was already here, being felled, and that felled area then being managed as meadow. And so it was meadowland surrounded by ancient woodland for 150 or so years. So if you'd have taken the decision to want to move this back into a woodland management system, what you would have done was let the native and local woodland flora recolonize this habitat. The assemblage of trees planted in this area are beyond ludicrous for various reasons. There are all sorts of things in here which would not naturally occur, and many individuals which are really, really quite extraordinary choices and are dying out. A very, very frustrating activity indeed. And last rant of the day, and this is a plea, a plea to you all. Please support the campaign to save Warren Farm from severe damage and or destruction. This is a site which some of you may have heard about on social media. I have been working with local community activists in recording the wild plants on the grassland in these fields. It is very species rich. It has good quality acid grassland, good quality neutral grassland, and some fine species in the hedgerows as well. There are several species of plant on the site which are nationally considered at risk of extinction and an even longer sphere list of species which are at risk of extinction in the London area. So this is a site which is not threatened by tree planting overtly, but that may appear on the horizon, but through development of various forms at the moment in the form of a sports centre or football centre. So this is a really important piece of metropolitan open land in West London that needs your support. It's also fair to say that with London's developing attitude towards the idea of rewilding, this is a site which needs to be thought about in this context. Now, I'm going to move to happier themes and talk a little bit more about orchids because everybody loves orchids and they're rather delightful. It'll lighten the mood a little bit. So again, I've returned to the mapping and played around a little bit. Uh, and what I've done is I've created two maps, all records and post-1999, of grass orchids associated with calcareous and, grass and, and neutral grasslands. So the orchid species or genera that are in this are Ophrys, the bee orchids, pyramidal orchid, um, common spotted orchid, and there's one or two others which I'll talk about in a moment. So these are species which we associate with grasslands in this country. Now again, once more, you will see there's a band to the north and a very, very strong, distinct band to the south with a bit of hollowing out of the London area because a lot of the London area soil is neutral to slightly acid, but with the odd bump here and there that may be reflecting various other things going on. For example, around here, there's, there's probably a chalk pit or something like that. So this is the broad distribution of chalkland and grass and neutral grass and plants orchids in the London area. You'll see that there appears to be some level of loss and reduction in abundance compared to the due data sets, but I've put this together very quickly, so it may be a bit of a data skew. But it's fair to say that orchids are, broadly speaking, species that are associated with old landscape with one or two exceptions, which I shall talk about in a moment. And as increasingly old landscape in South East England is becoming more and more fragmented and broken up and destroyed, the habitat for these plants is gradually diminishing or degrading. But, oh, I have put it this way around. Um, I'm going to talk about two plants now, which um, one of which is a newcomer and one of which are um, long established. These are two plants which are associated with grassland and open habitats. They're both widespread European species, um, one of which is a very recent occurrence in this country. Serapius parviflora was first found on the Cornish coast about 25, 
30 years ago. Extremely rare and the population has probably died out. There's only a very, very small amount. And then summer before last, a gentleman found this plant growing on a green roof in a central London in a, in a private building. There are actually now about 30 plants, but plants on the site, it, is, it seems to be spreading quite rapidly. This is a recent expansion into the London area. It hasn't established on grassland as yet, but a, an equivalent on a green roof. To the right, we have Anacanthus mori, a green winged orchid. This is a plant which at one time was really widespread and abundant across large swathes of England. It can locally still grow in the many thousands, but it has lost an enormous amount of its population and range in England and is now listed potentially at risk of extinction in this country. All of the grassland sites for this plant in the London area in Greater London have now been lost. The last one of which was a cemetery in South London where it hasn't been seen for about 20 years. This particular photograph was taken around the corner from my home on the Isle of Wight. However, like Serapius, this plant has returned to London, or rather unlike Serapius, which is a new newcomer, this plant has returned to London and is found on two or three green roofs in central London. So green roofs could and should be the way forward in terms of establishing new habitats for wild plants, such as this, which are associated with grasslands. Sticking with the orchid theme, I'm going to talk about two species which are often seen to be expanding in range and abundance in the last decade or so, probably through to climate change. So, for example, bee orchid has in recent years colonised parts of southern Australia, or southern Australia, southern Scotland. And Anacanthus pyramidalis, the pyramidal orchid, has also expanded its range. Both species most definitely have gone through historic declines in parts of the London area um, through overly vigorous management of grassland and mowing lawns every moment that a blade of grass gets higher than that. But these species are very adaptable compared to some other orchid species. They are very, very able to colonize new landscape, and new habitat. They're sometimes found on slag heaps, et cetera, et cetera, roadside verges, motorways, et cetera. So these are two adaptable species which have colonized new habitat, unlike some of our other orchids. This is a rather peculiar occurrence. This is Epipactis hellebrine, and this is usually associated with woodlands in this country. This rather grand individual with many flower spikes looking exceedingly healthy was growing in grassland on Horsenden Hill. Thankfully, not in the exact location that has been severely damaged and ultimately destroyed that I was just talking about a moment ago. And in fact, this actually grows within about 20 metres of a large, a fairly large patch of Dyer's greenweed. So this is a rather odd occurrence of a woodland orchid or usually woodland orchid growing in very open and very sunny grassland. Now, two species of orchid which are very, very rare in the London area, but are having different fates, um, are, are, I'm going to talk about momentarily. Orchis anthrophora was up until relatively recently known as Acerus anthrophora, is one of those orchid species which is associated with old landscape, with old chalk grassland, with ancient chalk pits. It is a slow moving species that doesn't move around in the landscape very easily and is a significant decline across much of its range in this country and is potentially at risk of extinction. It is one of this country's less showy orchids, but it has a certain quality and charm of its own. Next to it is the rather fabulous and rather extraordinary Himantoglossum hersinum, the lizard orchid. It probably should be better known as, or also known as the goat orchid, because hersinum means goat, referring to the fact that is, this is a rather stinky plant, said to smell a bit, a little bit like goats. Himantoglossum hersinum has got a really, really fantastic history in this country. 
is right on the northern edge of its global range. It's a Mediterranean plant principally, or on the sort of central and southern European as well. Um, and it is only on the edge of its range in, in southern England. It has gone through, as our climate has ebbed and flowed over the last year, it has gone through range expansions and range contractions. So for a large chunk of the 20th century, it was almost entirely restricted to East Kent. It is now going through an expanding range and has been found in many places in southern England and even as far as Lincolnshire now, where it hasn't been seen for many decades. This particular individual was found in London. It's the first London record for this species ever or in recorded history. So I'm going to say in first record in 300 years. Now, what is important about this record, and it also is really important about actually about how we have biases about what's good habitat and what's bad habitat often is, this plant was found in a very urban landscape behind a very ordinary bus shelter, growing in very ordinary grassland, surrounded by dog poo, crisp packets and coke cans, and was thriving. So again, going back to this idea about tree planting, people need to be very careful about where they decide to plant things, because you could be wiping out a really rare plant. Just because you think it looks rubbish doesn't mean it is. Oops, and I'm just going to finish on a little smorgasbord of prettiness to finish the evening off with We've got two plants which are strongly associated with chalk grassland and Phyllis, the kidney vetch, another member of the chalk gram of the pea family. This is a species which in the London area is really primarily associated with the South Downs. Oregano wild marjoram is rather more widespread, it's a little bit more tolerant and it sometimes escapes gardens because it's sometimes grown as a garden plant, both of which are highly valued to and for invertebrates. Two species here, which uh, one of which I had to photograph in Northamptonshire. This is Sanguisorba officinalis and a delightful drop word, Philippendula vulgaris. These are members of the rose family. These are related to roses and hawthorns, both of which are associated with very, very different types of grassland. Philippendula vulgaris is primarily in England associating with species rich chalk grassland, whereas Sanguisorba officinalis is a plant of species rich water meadows, lowland hay and hay meadows, and often in quite clay soils. This is a plant which is now very rare in London, occasionally turns up as planted individual, but is now greatly diminished from its former abundance. Philippendula is still locally frequent in chalk in the south. And a little snippet of some prettinesses to sort of finish on bar one is to talk about a few members of the daisy family. These are incredibly important plants across a wide range of ecosystems in this country, but particularly in grassland habitats. Knapweeds are really useful indicators of species rich grassland. And in fact, the location I mentioned, the Horsenden Hill, had very good quantities of knapweed in it. And it also had this plant feed and the Pulicaria dysenterica. I just noticed a spelling mistake there, more to me. Now, Pulicaria tends to be associated with damper neutral grasslands that are sometimes inclined to acidity. It's often fine in that zone grading into wetlands on the edges of rivers, for example. But this is still a locally frequent plant on an area surrounding the Thames, for example. Now, I put oxide daisy in on the end because oxide daisy is a very interesting species in that we often think of it as being associated with old meadows. But in many habitats, it seems to play a rather ephemeral role in coming in little patches of the landscape that may have been opened up and then growing for a few years and then being gradually shaded out by these longer lived perennials, such as the knapweed. So sometimes when you find oxide daisy, growing on roadside verges, for example, you've got a landscape which has potentially had some level of disturbance. However, on coastal sea cliffs, for example, outside of the London area, this is very much associated with ancient and old landscape that is undisturbed. And these are the very last, just to finish off with a 
a delightful trio of bright colours. Um, these are all plants that are associated primarily with the chalky soils of the London area. Clustered bellflower is one of our most beautiful chalk grass and plants. It's also found in limestone areas uh, and is found quite abundantly in suitable habitats in the Chilterns, just to the north of London, and is pretty frequent in some of the chalk grasslands in the Surrey area. Rather curiously, it is absent from large chunks of the Kent chalk on the North Downs for very strange reasons that we don't understand. There is one small area near the River Medway where it still it is locally abundant in about two or three locations, but it is a strangely rare plant in Kent compared to Surrey. Common century is one of these more adaptable, widespread members of chalky soils and limestone soils and neutral species rich grasslands. It's quite a small plant, so it's not good at competing. People are often surprised to learn that this is actually related to the gentians. Essentially, it is a gentian. It's a pink one, not a blue one. And it's a short, it's a short lived biennial or annual art, depending on what's happening to it. And the last thing is Cruciata labour piece, crossword, which is a relative of coffee and our goosegrass or cleavers, the weed, sticky willy that we get growing in gardens and hedgerows. This is a rather lovely plant, usually strongly associated with chalky soils. It's locally still quite common in parts of Surrey. It is rare in the north of London. There's only two or three locations where it survives because of the impact of urbanisation. And this is a species which, once more, nationally used to be considered common, is still locally frequent, but its numbers have declined so greatly that it is now listed as being potentially at risk of extinction. I think it actually is near threatened, as it's described, and um, this because of its decline. So our grassland habitats, which I've given you a really quick snippet, are some of our most species rich, both in terms of the plants, but also the invertebrates and the fungi. I've not even discussed fungi. I meant to, and then I forgot about it. Um, species rich habitats that we have on these islands. And tragically, they're some of our most vulnerable. And we really, really need to do our best to protect the ones that remain. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. That was a really great overview. And uh, there were a lot of kind of responses to your criti criticisms, particularly of this kind of let's plant trees everywhere kind of approach. Um, so I think you I think you basically have got pretty much everybody in the audience on your side. But it is important. And I think somebody mentioned about, you know, can you kind of encapsulate that into a, use, a leaflet for councillors or whatever? So it's it's certainly a message that I think is not it's very hard to get across because there is a kind of perception that you know tree planting is a really good thing and to where people are planting them and not understanding the consequences of what they're doing it can be incredibly frustrating so um but th thank you and I, I like the way you were championing the dandelions so thank you particularly for doing that and of course we've got the um there's that handbook now isn't there that to all those different aphrodite well, species they're so. still darn difficult even with the handbook <laughs> <laughs> but you know worth kind of having yeah. a go and i thought we might yeah. be better off yeah. with the handbook than without but yeah no really yeah. really just a fascinating group of plants that are very undervalued so great you know thanks for pointing those out and uh, you know you just had so many interesting species and interesting stories um, I'm going to go over to Anka and just see if there are a few questions that we've, we haven't got very much time, but are there one or two questions we could pick up from the chat, Anka? Yeah, actually there are. Um, so there were a couple mentions about the corky fruited water dropwort. Say that 10 times fast. Okay. <laughs> um, so Alison mentioned that there, um, there are some in Surbiton. Um, yep, and yep. Ernie said that there is another well-known site on the border of Southwark and Lewisham. Yes. Um, now, Mark was asking if it grows in the Scottish Highlands by any chance. No. So, it, as is typical with members of the carrot family, many of them are this sort of, from a distance, they're just like white plates of fluffiness. Um, and to identify them, you need to look at them in more detail than that image kind of gives. And 
white sort of dish shaped things are found in carrot family across the board. So there are many of them, for example, will be found right across the world, including Scotland with that general form. To get to know them, you have to look at details of the foliage, but particularly the fruit. So I say this particular species of Onanthe is restricted to southern central England. I think even in Oxfordshire, it's a scarce plant only in the south. And if, certainly if you get as far as Northamptonshire, it's, I don't think it exists at all. It's very, very rare. So it's a southern plant. Onanthe crocata, its big burly relative, is widespread in large chunks of north and west and southern Britain and also in parts of East Anglia and is very abundant in parts of um, the cooler, in the, the warmer bits of western um, Scotland. Highly poisonous. This is one thing about Onanthe and members of the carrot family is that some of them are highly toxic. And I, I, I did just to, I thought it was very interesting that the way that it seems to be spreading within the London area and this idea about that it's it's not obviously the only species, but it's being spread by mowing machinery. Yeah. I, I, I think that's really interesting. And um, this was an idea that was put forward, I think, by Nick Bertrand, who right. has found who found several of the locations for it in the Lewisham area. There's a very good, and this is the one that Ernie's referring to, there's a very good population of it on the edge of Sydenham Hill Wood, where it is doing very, very well in a nice piece of grassland under Sycamore. The other area where it does turn to it, I didn't know about the ones in, uh, was it Southwest London, but there, there are two or three locations in the Richmond area, but I didn't know about the Surbiton one, but I suspect the local botanists do. So it is largely found there in, in those kind of clusters. Lewisham, Richmond. And this is an interesting thing. You tend to find some of these plants which are being distributed by machinery tend to be within boroughs because the machine mm. really moves around the borough. So there's a couple of other species. In the early days of power in Firma becoming established in the London area, this recent colonist, it was Hackney, Islington, and a couple of other boroughs, and it's now radiated out. It, it definitely. And there's another, there's Rhinanthus um, angustifolia, um, which is another hemiparasite of grasslands from southern south London, a rare plant. Is believed to have been spread in a similar way. Interesting. Uh, Anka, we've probably just got time for one last question. So do you want to pick up one last thing? Yeah, I think um, what we'll go with is the trees. Um, as uh, Maria mentioned earlier, there was a lot of agreement um, with the tree planting. Um, now, Sue was asking, please, are there any stats or statistics on how much carbon grassland stores would help to know to fight the over-enthusiastic tree planters. Yeah. Um, I actually found a fantastic graphic a while ago. I need to dig it out. It will depend upon the grassland ecosystem, but species-rich permanent grassland, again, this is about our visual recording. Most of that carbon capacity is not in the green stuff above, it's in the roots and the associated microbial diversity in the soil. So the vast weight of carbon is in the soil with grasslands. That's why we've got this kind of bias against them because we see these big chunky trees. Um, some studies have indicated, for example, if you plant a plantation woodland such as Harmony Wood on pre-existing species rich grassland, for the first up to 30 years, you're actively increasing the carbon debt because the trees kill the grassland and release carbon dioxide. And it takes 30 years for the trees to get to a decent enough size to balance that into equilibrium. So you are potentially, if you're planting trees in grassland, you are potentially for the first couple of decades making matters worse, which is a pretty terrifying thing. Um, there are various papers and stuff out there on the internet. I'd have to do some delving. I mean, lots of people have done work on this. It's a, a pretty large field and, and very well studied about carbon in grasslands, woodlands, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of work done on it. This is what makes the whole thing about trees so extraordinarily ludicrous. You know, trees are wonderful and amazing things. And please don't go with a message that I'm anti-tree. Trees are fantastic and important but we need to be a little bit more nuanced about what we do with them. So that's a good note to finish on, I think. And if at some point there are a couple of those um, papers about that, um, you know, the carbon, 
we could put pick up and circulate yeah. people yeah. then do let me know and i'm kind of happy yeah. to do I, found, that. I found a really fantastic graphic yeah. which i posted on twitter about two months ago i'll see if okay. i can and it really nicely presents in a graphic manner this 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 truth on the thing about grass in the london era i'm about providing evidence one of the things that we're working on within the London Natural History Society in conjunction with Giggle is we're pre going to produce a what's called a rare plant register, which will list all of the rare endangered plants in the London area by borough. And many of those will be grassland plants, I can assure you. And this will be hopefully when we've got it done, it's probably going to take us about another 18 months, frankly, to finish. Uh, because Remember, we're all volunteers. This will be a very useful tool for local activists to wave in front of the boroughs and also at the GLA because their current list is absolutely wretched. Mm. So, yeah, OK, so that's all kind of more more kind of ammunition for people to, you know, to challenge um, simplistic, uh, you know, ideas, and which is, you know, really important. So thank you again so much for that. We could carry on chatting and answering questions for another hour or so, but I, I, I'm afraid I'm going to have to kind of wrap things up now. Thank you ever so much again to Mark. That's been another really fascinating evening. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming and for taking part and for all your interesting questions and your participation. Our next talk is the second one in our Jamaica series, and it's on Thursday, the 5th of May. It will be all about the swallowta swallowtail butterflies of Jamaica. So do sign up for that one. And we're really lucky to have some local experts who are going to be providing presentations for that event. So it should be really fascinating. See our website for details of all our talks, sign up to the mailing list, join if you were one of those people who promised that you were going to, and we hope to see you all again very soon. Look after yourselves, and in the meantime, we wish you all the best. If you'd like to unmute yourself to say goodbye, that's great, and there's lots of really nice messages coming through in the chat saying thank you and how much people have valued the presentation, so thank you very much for those as well. So goodbye for now, and we'll see you